Yes, amen. Well, look, I want to talk to you a little bit about tonight. The Lord's been putting some things on my heart while I was on vacation. And uh, I want to talk to you about uh, body, soul, spirit tonight. Mostly I want to talk to you about the soul, though. But before we get started, you know, this is another scripture that was really on my heart coming out of Titus chapter 3. Verse 5, most of us in this place, I would imagine, we're saved. It looks like we're saved. We're, I don't even know that we have a whole lot of new believers in here. But we don't ever really know for sure what people's understanding of the scriptures are. So let's just go ahead and read this. It says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us. I put a wrong little letter in there. Sorry about that. Abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. You know, this is the miracle of salvation. I want you to know that. You and I can't work enough works of our own righteousness in order to receive the new life that Jesus offered whenever he died on the cross. I was thinking about this word. This is really not a right way to use the word. But I was thinking about the word generator when I was thinking about regeneration. Really, the word in the Greek means a renovation. Yes. So whenever we were born of Adam, we were born in sin. And when we get born again, the Holy Spirit comes in and he does a, a renewal, a regeneration, a renovation, right? But if you think about uh, a generator, the, previously, the reason you need a generator is because the electricity is off. And there's no power. Amen. But whenever you and I get saved, it's a supernatural miracle. You know, I've been trying to, whenever I talk to people and I get an opportunity to share the truth of the gospel, I want them to know and I want them to understand that whenever you get born again, it truly is a supernatural miracle. That whenever you and I yield our hearts and lives to the Lord, the Holy Spirit comes in. And just like a place that had no power before, the Holy Spirit gives life and he brings change to the inside of who we are. You know, I was talking to somebody during the week and it's not important who it was. But whenever I was talking to them, I told them, I'm concerned about your soul. I'm concerned about your soul because I don't see the life of God inside of your spirit, man. You, you, people say that they love the Lord. I said that actually. There, there was an opportunity. I went to a church and, and he wanted everybody to talk. And, and, and somebody said, so I wasn't going to talk. But I said, Lord, you'll give me a sign if you want me to talk. And, and, and he wanted everybody to talk. He said it. That's what the pastor said. I want everybody to talk. And then somebody said something. And, and, and what it did, he said that the Lord had been stirring him up to get into his word. And you know, one of the things that the Lord had me to say in that moment was this, is that in all of the jobs that I have, I'm going to miss some of those jobs. I'm thankful that I'm going to keep at least probably one of them for a little while. Let me tell you why. I have a, a very, very unique vantage point compared to other pastors. There's a lot of pastors that have been sitting in their offices and sitting in an ivory tower, if you will, and they're not really rubbing shoulders with the world. They really don't know. It's about, you know what they know about the world? They watch it on Fox News. That's what they know about the world. They don't know how bad off people are. They don't know how bad off real church people are because they're not even out there really rubbing shoulders with people that are in the church. And many of the preachers that you and I have grown to love and to like, they don't even realize that most of the world out there, most of the church world out there, not everybody understands the message of the cross. That's right. And let me tell you something. I've been talking to people about the message of the cross for a long time. And if you think that people get a revelation of it immediately, that is not true. Even with the anointing of the Holy Spirit, there's many times people flounder in the faith and they want to know the truth. And then, you know what, I'm getting ahead of myself. But look, if we are regenerated, if we have the generator of the Holy Spirit, if the life of God is on the inside of us, if the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 6 and 17, has been made one with our spirit, and the life of God is on the inside of us, hallelujah, and then if we know the truth of the gospel that says that the old man died in Christ, that says that Jesus has ripped 
the veil through the flesh that was ripped for us, giving us access into the Holy of Holies, where you and I now have access to grace in which we stand. If we understand that the grace of God is the spirit of God that's changing us on the inside. If we understand that Colossians 2, 14 and 15 says that Jesus, not only did he forgive us of our sin, but he broke the power of sin through what he did at the cross. I'm getting ahead of myself, church, but I got to tell you something. Something has been disturbing me for a long time. Why do we? who understand the message of the cross so well. Why do we focus on the first half of the letters? Why do we never go on to the last half of the letters? Why do we only talk about the theology of the, of the truth? No, well, praise God for the theology. Praise God for the doctrinal truth that Jesus died on the cross and that our faith in that releases grace into our life, which is a supernatural help of the Holy Spirit to give us freedom and to give us life. But why do we stop at Romans 8? Why do we not push through to the end of Ephesians? Why do we not move through to the end of Colossians? Why do we not speak of the whole letter to the Galatians? Because if we did, we would also understand that there's supposed to be fruit that follows. We would also understand that the power of the Holy Spirit is supposed to make us to where we prefer our brother over ourselves. Well, we don't gossip about our brothers and sisters in the Lord. Well, we don't lie. Oh, help us, Lord. Well, we don't fornicate. Well, we don't live our lives in drunkenness and immorality. No, the word of God says that we are free. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Where the liberty of the Lord is. But what the enemy has done is he's come in and he sold us a bag of lies. Right he sold us a bag of lies and we haven't even pushed through to get to the practical theology that says there's a certain way we're supposed to be living. Right. And I've had a problem. I've known that for a long time. You know, the first time that it ever even came to my attention was when David Borg was preaching about it in the Bible college six, seven years ago. Right. At some point in time, the message is supposed to produce free. The message of regeneration is supposed to produce fruit. The, the presence of the Holy Spirit in our heart and in our life. Did y'all hear what that brother said on Sunday? Did y'all hear what he said about that critical spirit? That would even, that, listen, I'm going to take it a step further, my friend. Not only should we be willing to fellowship with brothers and sisters that understand the cross as it regards salvation. Not only that, but listen, you know what I'm finding out? I'm finding out I'm learning stuff. I'm finding out I done had myself stuck in a box. I'm finding out that the critical spirit that has blinded my spiritual eyes, blinded my heart, has prevented me from being able to learn from other brothers and sisters. You know what I'm starting to realize? I'm learning from you. You know what I'm starting to realize? Listen, I don't know what you want to call it. I keep telling you, and, and we're going to get into some of this in a minute. I don't know what you want to call it. I don't know where you want to call it, wh where it was. I don't know if you want to call it, it was in my head. Whatever you want to call it, it's okay. I don't, I don't expect you to agree with everything I say. Do, do you realize that? that I don't, have, I've said that before, haven't yeah. I? That I don't expect you to agree with everything I say. right? But, but can I say this? I am the pastor. So I am allowed to speak what I see in the scripture. Right. Yeah. And, and listen, I have encouraged people, if you don't agree with something I say, let's get the scriptures together. Yeah. Let's get this. But let, me, let me not go down that path. Let's just, no, but really, I want to encourage you that if you would study to show yourself approved, a workman that rightly divides the word of truth, need not be ashamed. And if you do the work and you do the homework, not just your opinion. Yeah. You know, I know, this is another thing the Lord showed me over the last week. Men have a Men, listen, every last one of us in this place are full of opinions. I'm so tired of the opinions. I'm tired of my own opinions. I'm tired of my own opinions. I only want to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. And, men, and sometimes our opinions are right. And you know what? A lot of times our opinions are wrong. But something I'm learning about the Holy Spirit, he ain't never wrong. I want to hear 
what the Holy Spirit has to say. And listen, this is where it starts. The washing of regeneration. So when you got saved, the Holy Spirit came on the inside of you and he put his power source on the inside of you. And there's more power to be had. If, you're, if you haven't received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I want to encourage you to cry out to the Lord to receive more, to invite the Holy Spirit to give you more. Amen. I want to talk to you. Part of what I want to talk to you about tonight has to do with the temple because it's interconnected to the spirit, the soul and the body. We're going to cover a lot of ground before it's over with. But I want to give you some some New Testament truth. You know, some of the things that I've learned as I've studied the word of God is that a lot of times people are. Well, part of what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is also about evil spirits. All right. Evil spirits and how they affect people and how they affect even believers. I'm, I'm going to talk about that a little a little bit tonight. But 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 what I want you to, but what I want you to understand is this is that a lot of times and I feel very pretty confident about this. I haven't been able to do the study because I'm to the point too where I don't really care about words anymore. Vexed, possessed, oppressed, influenced, right. irritated, right. aggravated. Right. You know, I'm I'm just done with words. Right. Okay. And I'm also kind of done with, is it on them? Is it in them? I, I don't care about that anymore. This is what I told the preacher the other day. I said, well, let me just say this. If the spirit of God moves in this church and a devil manifests itself in this church, I'm going to lay hands and take authority over the evil spirit and cast that thing out, off, whatever you want to call it. He ain't getting glory up in this church. And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. And need I remind you, and I don't know why I got to keep reminding, but I'm going to keep reminding the course that God has brought us through in this church. You know how easy it is for people that ain't having to deal with nothing Right. To, to believe that they have the answers. Right. And I'm not saying this negatively. I'm not saying this in an ugly way at all. I'm trying to make a point. Whenever, and, I'm gonna, and I don't want to take up all my time, but whenever that young lady showed up here out of nowhere, out of nowhere on the same day Lily was here, okay, then when my daughter showed up, I wish I, anyway, y'all get the point. Then not only that, other things happening. So, you know, I even told somebody the other day, I'm like, so what is the story on that? I even said it. I said it. So what happened? Did, did Lily get with that first girl and say, hey, look, I give you 60 bucks right. and you can show up no. over here? I didn't even know what you believed in. I, 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 I get it. I get it. Mm-hmm. And that's what I'm trying to say. You, at some point in time, the eyes have to be open right. to what something is going on and that the Lord is trying to reveal things. Right. But one of the things I wanted to say about the scripture is this. I know, and I'm going to do this study, and I haven't done it yet, but you will be hard-pressed to find in after the cross, maybe the story with Philip, but i got to go back and look at that, after the cross, where you're going to see, in, especially not in the apostolic letters, Where the apostles are telling people that if they're having a problem with sin, that you got to have a deliverance service. That's not what you're going to see. But let me tell you what the Lord showed me the other day as I was laying prostrate on my face. The Lord spoke something to my spirit. You can do what you want with it, but this is what the Lord showed me. The Lord showed me you are so far from talking about the church world right now. So far from true biblical Christianity. The, the, The world is so inundated with demonic spirits. You, you are so far from biblical Christianity. You got people that say they love the Lord and they're out there and they're inviting little Wayne into their life. They're out there inviting Jay-Z into their life. They're out there running the roads, doing what it is that they want to do. Even people in the house of God, even people that understand the message of the cross, opening up their lives to demonic entities, opening up their lives in the midst of disobedience and in Fighting things into their lives, and then they wonder why That's right. Come on. there's so much havoc going on. You know, in New Testament Christianity, if you read the truth, what you'll learn through the book of Acts is this. Call upon the name of Jesus and you will be saved. And you can be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
spirit from on high so that you could receive power. Hallelujah. Dunamis so that you could be a witness for God in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the outermost parts of the earth. And then if you keep reading, you'll learn that Jesus truly did win victory for you and I at the cross. And then if you keep reading past that, you'll learn to prefer your brother over yourself. You'll learn that pride needs to die. You'll learn that you must surrender to the will of God with your life. You'll learn that liars don't enter in. Fornicators don't enter in. And you will learn to think upon these things, pure and holy things. And you will learn to consecrate yourself and to fast and to pray and to cry out to God that he would work in your heart and in your mind. And you would learn to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And it's more than just doing the math, my friend. It's fear and trembling. Not fear. I don't know if I said it recently, but I'm going to say it again. Not fear that he's just going to quash you. God doesn't want to quash you. He doesn't want to smash you. God wants to love you. God wants to love you. He wants to love me. He doesn't want to look for a reason to leave. He wants to look for a reason to stay. Right. He entered into covenant with us. But yeah. if we're sitting here and we not even reading the word of God for ourselves and we're leaving off all that instruction that Jesus died and that the Holy Spirit moved upon prophets of old to speak to us and we're just ignoring the word of God and then when we see it, we're not even yielding to it. That's a problem, church. Yes. That kind of fear. That kind of reverence, that kind of awe that would think to myself, oh my gosh, if I keep ignoring the voice that's speaking to me, if I keep ignoring the words that are written on this page, oh my gosh, I may not be able to hear anymore. Oh my, my ear might become dull to the presence of God. My ear might become dull to the voice of God and people run to and fro and they're looking. You know, Jesus said that the wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. Even the people that are sitting there wanting God to move and they say, they're looking for some. Listen, we want signs and wonders. I've been praying for signs and wonders. Lord, pour out your spirit of healing. Lord, pour out your, 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 your signs and wonders. Pour out your gifts in the church, not so that we can receive glory, but so that you can receive glory. But there's a balance to this, my friend. If you want to be a true believer, if you want to grow up and be, become mature in the faith, you're going to have to, at some point in time, quit sipping on a baba. Really, I mean, I don't mean to be rude. I'm just saying, you're going to have to quit drinking from a bottle and you have to start digging into the meat of the word of God. And you're going to have to allow the word of God to get on the inside, but not just to be a hearer. You know what James said? Don't be like the man that looks in the mirror. He sees his reflection, and as soon as he turns away, he forgets what manner of man he is. No, not just a hearer, but a doer of the word. Oh, you're preaching law. No, I'm not. I'm preaching obedience. Oh, I can't be obedient. Yes, you can, because Jesus died to set you free. Yes. That's the message of the cross. You think the message of the cross is just for us to see how many times we can say the word cross in a sermon? No, I told brother the other day, I said, no, you know, I've had people come against me. Like, I want to tell you, Sanballat and Tobiah. Remember that because we're going to talk about it. Sanballat and Tobiah. There were two guys that come around many, many years ago. You, you, got, you got a spirit of fear on you. You're not preaching the cross. Why well, am I not preaching the cross? Oh, because I didn't say the word cross enough times for you. Yeah, I could preach the message of the cross for an hour and I don't even have to say the word cross one time. It's all about redemption. It's all about the finished work of the Christ. It's all about New Testament truth that he came to set the captive free and that what yes. he did releases the power of the Holy Spirit. That's right. It's the Holy Spirit that gives the victory. Amen. He's the comforter yes. that's been called alongside. Yeah. So listen, going back to the temple of God. The Spirit of God dwells in you. There's a New Testament truth. What I was going to try to tell you is this. You will be hard-pressed to find a deliberate service in the New Testament, after the cross, I'm talking about a deliberate service. You might say that people were possessed that were believers, okay, or that the Satan entered them, but to see a deliberate service. I personally believe, I'm talking about in a born-again believer. 
Or you will have a hard time finding in the apostolic letters that that is the instruction for people that are dealing with sin on how to be free. But what you will see, John will tell you, you know what? If you do sin, guess what? You have an advocate with the Father, the Son. And what you will learn is the, the, the truth of repentance. And what we will learn if we can stick around long enough and ask the Lord to teach us that repentance is more. And I know I've been saying it a lot, but it's more than just saying that I'm sorry. It's it's uh, it, listen in the Old Testament. See, that's what I'm trying to get at. You can learn great truths in the Old Testament. Sometimes people say, well, you can't find the scripture for me. Oh, I can find plenty of scripture. You may not like my method of interpretation. You might not like the fact that I see within the Old Testament, New Testament truth. And then I can pull it out. And whenever I give you a scripture right here that the Apostle Paul, the scholar of the New Testament, says, Know you not that you are the temple of God. What do you think the Apostle Paul was doing when he compared believers to the temple of God? He was comparing believers to the temple of God. Why would he be comparing believers to the temple of God? Because the Holy Spirit lived inside the Holy of Holies. In the temple of God. Know ye not that you are the temple of God. And that the spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God. Him shall God destroy. For the temple of God. Is holy. Which temple you are. Now why would he need. To write this. To a Christian church. If there wasn't the possibility. That believers. Could defile. The temple of God. And to understand that if believers would persistently defile the temple of God, persistently ignore the voice of God, persistently quash, I like that word now, quash the voice of God, do we not think that there's a possibility that there could be a problem? Listen, and Corinth was about like what life is now. Corinth was about like what New Orleans is on steroids. Two ports, temple prostitutes. You understand that? Y'all heard me talk about that before. You understand that in pagan religion, that's how they worship God. Probably not going to have an empty church on that one whenever people are being living by their flesh. The sailors would come into the two different ports. They would go to the house of ill repute, which was a temple to pagan gods, and they would pay temple prostitutes to engage in lewd sexual acts, and that's how they worshiped false gods. I know that that's a hard thing for some young people, but that's the truth. And now we live in the midst of a society where lewdness is everywhere that we turn. It's all over the, the TV. It's all over the airwaves, right? You get the point. He goes on to say uh, in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, what? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? Which you have of God and you are not your own for you are bought with a price. You are bought with a price. Amen. The precious blood of Jesus. Jesus had to give his life so that we could be regenerated. So that the Holy Spirit could live in us. This is serious business, my friend. Sometimes we take for granted the things that God has done for us. And we live in the midst of a church world that everything, all, all we People want to hear, I'm not saying you, I'm just saying, all they want to talk about is the love of God. But it's a different kind of love. It's a different kind of peace. They, they talk about a love that doesn't include the, the truth of the cross. They, they, they don't want to talk about sin. And that is truly rampant in the midst of the modern church. Uh, so let's go back to the soul. And the, now look, this is going to get a little bit deep here. But look, if... One thing that you know tonight, I gave you a simple version of the gospel. That when you heard the truth of Jesus and you believed, if you got saved, the Holy Spirit came in and he did a renovation in your heart. That's right. And it's a supernatural miracle. You can't work yourself to salvation. Hallelujah. Jesus did it all for you. Right. And if you will continue to yield to the truth of God's word, if you will continue to read the word, pray, ask the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you, and you will yield your heart to him. You know what's going to happen? You're going to grow up. You're going to grow up, and you're going to become strong in the faith. 
Okay, now we're getting into uh, 301 level fun. All right, I think, anyway. So what, some of the things that I wanted to kind of mention to you is, so, so whenever you get saved, um, we just talked about regeneration, and I'm going to put this right here. I'm going to write the words Holy Spirit right there in the middle, right? And the reason I wrote the words Holy Spirit right there in the middle, I don't know if you can see it too well or not, is because, again, 1 Corinthians 6 and 17 says this, that whenever you get saved, your spirit and the Holy Spirit become one. The Holy Spirit is living on the inside of your spirit. Now, we're going to talk about the temple in a moment because whenever you go to the inner court, to the holy place, to the holy of holies, you're talking about the difference between, I believe there's a type here of the body, the soul, and the Holy Spirit. I'll also tell you that I believe when it comes to prayer that there's different levels to prayer. I just, I just felt like I needed, as a matter of fact, when I was praying earlier by myself, I was prompted by the Holy Spirit to, to let y'all know that tonight. I hope and pray that we all pray as believers, but I need you to understand that there's different levels of contacting or making a connection with God. And that many times the, the simple, and I'm not saying that God doesn't answer all kinds of prayers. That's not what I'm trying to say. But whenever we're in these, on the outside, in the courtyard, those types of prayers, then you know what? They're, they're very, they're not getting very intimate. We're not getting very intimate in making a deep connection with the Lord in those types of prayers. When we enter into the holy place where the light of God is located, where the table of showbread is located, where the incense is on this side of the veil, we're getting closer to the heart of the Lord. But when we enter into the holy of holies, if you've ever been there in your prayer life, if y'all know what I'm talking about, then, then it makes sense. If you've never been there in your prayer life, it may not make sense. And I don't say that to be ugly. I just want you to know, I'm trying to help you, that there's different levels in prayer. And whenever you enter into the Holy of Holies, you will know it because your heart makes a connection with the Holy Spirit at a whole other level. And your heart starts to beat more like the heart of God. And your, and your prayers become a lot less selfish and they start to sound a whole lot more like the word of God and you begin to hear the heartbeat of God and the next thing you know you're not praying about your own personal stuff near as much as you are praying for souls as you are praying for people to that the Lord would minister to them and do a work in them amen and I just want you to know that there's a that there's a, pro, a progression like that now right here where we talk about the body I'm just going to write this I wanted to put the word flesh. I don't want to spend too much time on this diagram, but I do want to try to explain some things. Whenever we're talking about, because look, we do understand that the flesh is more than just the body. Right? And if you don't understand that, just stick with me. And you may not understand everything that I'm trying to talk about but by the time this is over with. But I do believe these things are important if we're going to try to continue to grow and understand what we're dealing with whenever we're walking with the Lord. The flesh is also the fallen part of man. The word flesh can mean physical flesh. Jesus was born in the flesh. That means he was born of a woman. But Jesus didn't have a sinful nature. Jesus had no sin, right? But sometimes the word flesh describes the sinful nature. But the sinful nature manifests itself in this physical world through our physical body. There's something connected to our physical body that actually likes sin, yeah. right? Yeah. But look, it's not just the flesh. And see, this is where some people may, may not agree with me. Look, I want to tell you something. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 says this, that the Lord wants to wholly sanctify. Yeah. W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy. Not holy as in Holy Spirit. Holy, as in holistic. He wants the whole thing saved. But the whole thing ain't saved, my friend. The whole thing is not saved. If it was saved, we wouldn't be told in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23, and in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, that we need a renewed mind. And that we need to put off the old man. Because you see, the soul is made up of the mind, the will, 
and the emotions. I mean, there's, you can find this in the Greek New Testament whenever you do a basic study on these words, soul. And listen, when it's not just the word soul. It's also the word, the word, uh, the word for soul, but also cardia, which is the word for, where we get the word cardiac, heart. And also the word mind, nuance. All of these words describe parts of the inner man, but it's talking specifically about the soulless realm. Now, I wanted to try to tell you something. I'm not trying to be smart. I'm really not. But I, but I, wanted, to, um, I wanted to show you this. Okay? So this is a Greek word right here. So it's a Greek word. I don't know if you can see it. Suke. It's psi, upsilon, chi, epsilon. Now, if you were going to transliterate this word, that's a big old word, right? I know. It's a big old word. Transliteration. What does that mean? You take letters from a language like in the Greek and you, and you take that letter and you put it into a new language. So it's not a translation. It's not a definition. It's just you're taking the letters from the Greek and you're turning them into English letters. Does that make sense? All right. So I'm going to transliterate suke, psi, the sound is psi. You get it? Su, upsilon, chi, which is the X right there, epsilon, suke. So now we made an English word out of the Greek word. I know y'all seen me do it like this before to some extent, but I'm just trying to give you a little more clarity. The Greek word doesn't have a Y. This is where we get the word psyche. This is where the word psychology comes from. So what I want you to know is I, hate, I don't like psychology as the answer. I don't mind understanding the human brain. I don't mind understanding the human soul. That's what I'm trying to get at here. I'm trying to prepare you to understand there's some things in your human soul. There's some things going on in your soul, my friend. In my, why do you think? I was thinking about this while I was on vacation. Y'all ever notice how much I talk about my dad? Yeah. I was thinking, like, dude, why do you talk about your dad so much? And I started thinking, you know what, little Matt, you still hurt. You still trying to please your daddy. You, nothing you ever did was good enough for you. I'm willing to admit it to you that I can realize something ain't completely right in my heart, even though the Lord has already spoken to me about these things. I'm going to be a big enough boy to admit to you that there's things deep down on the inside of our suitcase. So I'm not trying to talk about psychology, but I would like to talk to you a little bit about psychology, and I would like you to understand that there's some things with your soul too. Some things with your soul that you ain't been healed of. Because your soul, no matter what the preacher might tell you, has not been renewed, has not been redeemed, because you and I need a renewed mind, and the mind is part of the soul, and we need the mind of Christ so that we can start thinking like the Lord thinks, so that we can start thinking about our own lives the way the Word of God says we're supposed to. Now look, when we're talking about the flesh, listen, there's some kind of weird interface if I'm allowed to say it like that when you hook your airpods to your phone and there's an interconnect connectivity now achieved there's some kind of weird interface between the flesh and the soul what are you talking about preacher well I'm going to explain it to you and our th listen there is a relationship between the soul the mind the thoughts the will and the emotion and the sinful nature of man there's something about sin. Listen, if we, come on. If we, we're big people here, right? Yeah. There's something about sin that makes the body feel good at first. Yeah. They put little butterflies in your tummy. They make you feel all goose, goose bumpy. It'd be like all tantalizing. Till you know that later on you've got your face in the toilet. And you have some kind of stinky place. Needles in your arm, right? I know that that's extreme, you know, ab aborted babies. I mean, am I allowed to just talk straight truth? I hope so. I hope it's okay if I do that. Straight truth. The sin that is in the earth, the sin that is in the world, okay? And, but there's something that interfaces between the soul, the mind, the will, the emotion. Look, somehow the enemy, he's coming from the outside, right? Lust of the eyes. Okay, lust of the eyes is an eye. Lust of the flesh, pride of life, and 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 what is that? Would it, do we, could that be 
Is that possible that that's demonic? Of course it's demonic. There's not even a question there. This is exactly how the serpent tempted Eve. Right. When she saw that the fruit was pleasant to the eye, good for food, and that it would give that it was good to give them knowledge, she partook, or however the word was, you get it? That she partook. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. Exactly. Straight up, not just demonic, satanic. Yeah. So all of the temptations that are coming at us from the outside, he's trying to work on our mind and our will and our emotions. And there's a connection between the flesh and the mind or the flesh and the soul. And he's trying to get us to revert to our old behavior and to give him permission. He's looking for permission. And once he gets permission, you thought. You was just going to say, I don't want it anymore. Come on, somebody help me out in this place. Somebody help me out in this place that since you've been a Christian, you bid on to something you wasn't supposed to bid on to. Come on, thank you, brother. I see that hand. And, and, and now, and then when you wanted it to go, I don't have to go over there to the door again, right? Stick my foot in the door. When you wanted it to go, it just didn't, it just didn't leave as quickly as you did. You thought it wasn't going to be that big of a deal? Okay, y'all with me. All right. So, but from the, so what ends up happening is, is that the temptation's coming from the outside and it's trying to reach up in here, but then the mind, when it yields, is that not how temptation, and not only that, like the sin is in us, the sin is still in us from the sinful nature. That's what James said. He said, when anybody be tempted of, be tempted of evil, let him not say he's tempted of God, for God does not tempt anyone with evil, but yet instead we're drawn away by the lust that is in us. So the enemy knows. But look, deep down in our spirit, <laughs> spirit cries, the deep cries out the deep, spirit cries out the spirit. Jesus is saying, dude, those that will worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. And the whole time, the voice of truth, he's wanting to speak to us. And so many times our mind, our will, our emotions are wanting to look for a justification to sin. We let the devil play games in our own mind. We let him deceive us. We justify our own actions at the expense of our walk with God. Help us. Help us. We, every per person in this place right now, I know you love the Lord. Every last one of you, you love the Lord. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus has already given us victory. And I'm here to tell you that biblical Christianity says that we need to get our mind to line up with his mind. And we need to surrender ourselves under the authority of the word of God. And that when we do that, grace will be released in our life. Grace and power from the Holy Spirit. Normal Christianity is not supposed to be that demon spirits are living on the inside of people. But whenever, whenever people do not yield right. to the truth and they walk outside of disobedience, I guarantee you I'm going to have, coming up soon, as soon as so, uh, uh, sister's better, I'm going to have two people give a testimony on the same night. And I want to hope all of y'all can be here so that we can get two sides of a story. Right. And I'm hoping that when they give their testimony, maybe with a couple of questions to prompt, we will see a very common thread. The common thread is always going to be acts of disobedience right. that started yeah. the process. Right. And guess what? Whenever those acts of disobedience lead to that, what ends up happening is the longer it lingers, right. the less we can fear, Ooh. the less we can hear. And we can think that we're okay mm -hmm. when in reality we're not. Mm -hmm. That's where repentance comes. True biblical Christianity realizes by the only the grace of God yeah. that I've gone the wrong way and I repent. I change my mind. Yeah. I agree with God that I was wrong right. and that he was right. All right. So so real quick, I just I did want to say something like this before I get into some of the Old Testament stuff. I wanted to ask you if. You know, each and every person in this place, you know whether or not there's something in your life that's not of the Lord, right? I mean, like, like I'm, you know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about that Hebrew scripture where he says, let's lay aside every weight in the sin that so easily besets us. I'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hand on that one because that's between you and the Lord. But you know whether or not those things are plaguing your life. 
And if they are, I just want to encourage you to truly get on your knees and to cry out to God to have his way. Now, if you would say, though, you know what, preacher, I just don't know of anything that's in me. Okay. All right. I don't know of anything that's in me. But I will admit to you that there's been times in my life that I've been more on fire for God than what I am now. Okay. If that be the case, I would ask you to try, what do you call it? Is it, I want to say scroll, but it's, I want to say, I want to say a better word is like scrib. Like whenever you're on, you, well, yeah, when you're, when you're on YouTube and you want to back it up, right? Rewind. You know how fast it goes on the frame? <laughs> okay. So I want you to try to go ahead and put your finger on that little button of life and go ahead and roll backwards to the spot that you remember when you were on fire for God. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you get up inside your own head, inside your psychology, inside your soul, and to try to find the spot where you left off from where you were. I don't care whether or not you justify whatever your actions are in your own mind. I don't care if somebody gave you permission to do it. I'm trying to ask you to, to rewind the tape and go back to the spot where you last remember being on fire for the Lord and to try to ask the Lord to reveal to you what the act of disobedience was because it's very likely there was an act of disobedience that you allowed to linger so long that that you can no longer hear the voice of God contending with you. I hope that makes sense. So not only is the, the things trying to filter in through the soul. And then look, once we let it in, do you think that it doesn't start to hinder all this? Do you think it doesn't start to hinder this deep, intimate relationship between the Holy Spirit and our spirit? God wants us to be able to hear his voice. God wants us to be able to be led by him. And, and listen, okay, so then, but now check this out. Also, so whenever the Lord is speaking to us, he's speaking to us through the depths of our spirit. That's the voice of God. Y'all know what I'm talking about. It's kind of like you can say it's almost like in your belly, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about because y'all have all heard the voice of God. Maybe not, but let me tell you, Chloe, you probably have heard the voice of God. You're, you're kind of young, but I want to let you know that it's kind of like a thought. But it doesn't seem like it comes from the head. It's like you're not thinking about that thing. That's the best way I know how to describe it. You're not thinking about that thing, but then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you know, look, you know, can I tell you something? So I, I'm going to pick on Lily a little bit just because I know she's tough and she can handle it. So after that first time that whatever happened, one day she was praying for somebody at the altar and the Lord spoke to my heart. And, and so, the, you know, that's another thing as the pastor of the church. I wanted to say this real quick. As a pastor, see, you're allowed to have your own opinions, just like I'm allowed to have my own opinions. But one of the things that I was thinking about is this. If your opinion is wrong and you walk through life with your opinion being wrong, then you just affected yourself. Right. Not really that big. of. I mean, it's a big deal. Lord, forgive me. It's a big deal. If you let your opinions, your mindset, your soul get in the way of the voice of God and, and you missed it. I mean, we're going to talk about the judgment seat of Christ coming up because you see, we're doing all these works for the Lord. But if our motives aren't right, if we're doing works to be seen by men and we actually were transgressing the way the Lord wanted us to do it, we're going to be surprised. We may not hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant. I'm not trying to say he's going to close the door to the ark, but it might be a little bit different than what we expected is what I'm trying to say. And I don't know about you, but I want to spend all my time here on earth doing all these, trying to do work for the Lord, only to hear, oh, you wicked and unfaithful servant, you buried your one little talent in the ground, and now you ain't getting nothing. Right. Or, you know, I want to, no, I want, if he gives me five, I want to, I want to double it. <laughs> right? I want, but you get the point. So, so doing the work of the Lord and allowing God to have his way. All right? So when the Spirit of God starts to speak to us, he also moves from deep within and he will then go and he will move through the soul and he will move upon the body. Now, look, the enemy's trying to come in from the outside and trying to get us to take the world and bring it in. And the Holy Spirit's speaking from the inside and he's trying to get us to reach out and grab something good and bring it in. 
So, in other words, I don't know, always pick on music, but I'm going to pick on music a little bit. Yeah, I was thinking about Lil Wayne. I talked to somebody today. And, I, and, and you know what? They corrected me, and I'm going to receive the correction. I'm going to receive the correction. Because they're like, Jesus ate and eat with sinners. Yes, that is right. That is right. Jesus ate and eat with sinners. But let's also have a little bit of wisdom. I'm trying to talk about, let's, let's just pretend for a second you like Lil Wayne. And I know you know. I don't think you do, but let's just pretend for a second you like Lil Wayne and you like his stuff and you like the stuff he does. And you thought it would be kind of honorable. Lil Wayne gives you a little holla, holla. Hey, I'm ready to come on over, my friend. What you got? What kind of food you got? You gonna come sit down at the table? Me and you gonna do some fellowship? Huh? Would you let Lil Wayne in that condition come up in your house? I'm talking about in that condition. I'm not talking about he needs to hear about Jesus. He's ready to get saved. You're about to lay hands on him and cast devils out of him and get him saved. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Lil Wayne, still Lil Wayne, and Lil Wayne loves him some devil, and Lil Wayne loves him some street hood thug life stuff, and he's wanting to come up in the house and have fellowship. Are you going to let Lil Wayne in your house? Because if you think Lil Wayne is cool enough to let in your house, Brother, sister, you got a problem. You are at best a carnal Christian. Because I'm telling you right now, it would not be cool to invite Lil Wayne up in your house. And it would not be cool, but that's what people do. They invite Lil Wayne in their house. You know, look, I'm going to tell you right now, Robert and I, before we even knew what to think about demon spirits completely, we got called up one time. We walked up in that girl's house. She was like, Lil Wayne keeps talking to me, Lil Wayne. The kids were playing, what were they playing? On the TV, Grand Theft Auto. I mean, the dude stole a car, smoking a, a bomb down the road, and her, the children are watching this. This is the environment that we come into. This is an environment that is inviting devils into people's lives. And that's what I'm trying to tell you about. We are so far removed from biblical Christianity because these are people that say that they love God and they are opening up the doors to things and they are allowing things to come in. And I'm telling you right now, they are wreaking havoc on their lives. So, so the enemy is coming from the outside and he's trying to get our mind, our will. He's trying to break our will and he's trying to get us to reach out there. And I don't know, just turn on the tape player or to grab that thing that's unholy and to put it inside of our body. And now we're inviting sin in. Well, vice versa, the Holy Spirit is on the inside and he's speaking to us and he's moving through our will. He's moving through our mind and he's trying to get us to reach out and to grab something good. Go ahead. Grab my word and fill your heart with my word. Go ahead and put on some worship music. Come on, lift up your holy hands. Shake off those heavy bands. Let all God's people praise the Lord. Amen. That's what the Holy Spirit's wanting us to do. And when we do, we put more of the Lord on the inside. We building up, praying in the spirit, building up our most holy faith. The things of God. Amen. You get the point that I'm trying to make right there. Amen. All right. So I want you to understand, but listen, let me just say one more thing about the soul. Sometimes our mindsets, we carry over opinions from our old life. We don't like to get too deep on this. I'm telling you right now, I used to have a prejudice problem. I mean, I can talk about it now because I'm free. Hallelujah, I'm free. And I'm so glad I'm free. But I got it from the bad. It's a spirit. It is a spirit of hate. I can't sit here and talk to you about it because I don't want to be rude to people. But my dad, and listen, I don't think he was a racist because he would help people. But Lord, when they left, the things that he said. And I remember, never forget the first time my sister told him about himself. She's like, Dad, you're a straight up racist and you need to stop. But that stuff was on me. When I first started working as a nurse practitioner, and I didn't even know it, but you know what? You know how I know it was a spirit? Because once the Lord delivered me from it, it was gone. Yes. And then I could realize how wicked it was, how wrong it was. And now I can love people. 
So what are you trying to say, man? I'm trying to tell you that if you still got someone on the inside of you and you stereotyping people of different cultural groups in your mind and you're not allowing people, if you're not finding a common ground with people and meeting them where they are, Jesus ain't like that. Jesus isn't sitting there looking down on people because of the color of their skin or their cultural association. No. So what I'm trying to tell you is that that's part of your soul. That's part of your mindset. That's stuff you're carrying over from your old life. Yeah. Even, even sometimes we sit here and we can think, oh, but, I, but I'm helping somebody. But what if you're helped? To, see, because sometimes our good works can get in the way. Because we think that we're doing good works. But it's not what the Holy Spirit wants to happen. And we're helping people. Like I've told y'all the story before. How the Lord revealed to me. You reached out in your soul. Like, he didn't say it like that. But now I understand it. You reached out in your soul to help that person. You gave them money to help in this situation. But whenever somebody belongs to me. And there's always a time and a place for everything. That's why we have to hear from the Holy Spirit. Because sometimes the Holy Spirit is trying to teach somebody how to live with inside their means. Sometimes the Holy Spirit is trying to teach somebody how to trust in God. See, I was taking money from my dad and I got in an argument with him on the phone one day after the Lord had gotten a hold of me. And whenever I hung up the phone, the Lord spoke to my spirit and said, it's time you learn who your daddy is, son. You've been trusting in another human being and I want you to learn how to trust God. In me, but if somebody else is always coming to the rescue, to be, see that's a good thing, though. See, yeah, but sometimes good things. Why? Well, how, well, how you got scripture to back that up? Yeah, before Adam and Eve knew good and evil, they only knew God. And once you know good and evil, you can also hinder people with your good. And then I'm going to get into this again, so it's coming soon. So just be prepared that that sometimes when the motives of our heart are actually not for God to get glory, because look, you know what the Bible says? Don't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing. Don't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing. So if we're having a boop, 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 blow the trumpet, whenever we go to bring our offering to the Lord, that's a bad sign that that could possibly be our soul. And not the Holy Spirit. It's our mindset. See, because we can also do good things just as we can do evil things. And neither one of them are God things. We getting in the way. Does that make sense? All right. So I just wanted to kind of share with you real quick. It's already 815. You know what? Singers, musicians, y'all come up. I'm going to shut it down for tonight. But I did want to tell you, maybe I'll pick it up next Wednesday. Sambalot and Tobiah. Boy, I tell you what, that's some tricky stuff. Tobiah was an Ammonite, and Ammonites weren't supposed to be in the temple. Y'all ever read the story of Nehemiah? You know what? This is a good thing. Y'all try to read Nehemiah before next week. I'm just realizing, man, I just read Nehemiah straight through over the last two days, and I'm just like, wow. How amazing when we read the word of God, how much truth, instruction we can receive from God. I'm going to leave you with this little thought right here as they're kind of getting some stuff together. Okay, I don't raise your hand, but some of y'all in here have read Nehemiah before, right? Some of just kind of give me a little. All right, so nobody knows who's read Nehemiah. Nobody knows who hasn't read Nehemiah. I'm going to give you an opportunity. Y'all know I like to do a little quiz thing. If you had one word, now this isn't fair because I know the word I'm looking for and you may not, but we'll just see if somebody can throw it out there. If there was one word you could use to describe the book of Nehemiah, and I'll, I'll give you a hint. The Jews pray by it. The wall. Thank you. I was looking for somebody to give me that word. The wall. Why? Because the wall was broke down and the stones were burnt. And listen, you know what Proverbs 25, 28 says? That a man without restraint, a man without self-control is like a city without a wall. You know what a wall represents in the Old Testament? It represents protection. A city needs protection. A man that doesn't operate with self-control and restraint, he's like a city where there's walled down and the enemy now can come in. And the whole story about Nehemiah, though, is that the city is Jerusalem. And y'all know what I'm talking about when I'm saying Jerusalem. That is that the city of peace. 
When you and I desire peace on the inside of our life, we need the wall around. We need the protection of God. But when we're not operating in the power of the Holy Spirit and we're operating without self-control, that's a gift of the Spirit, my friend. Self-control is a gift of the Spirit. But you know, one of the things that I've learned about the gifts of the Spirit, too, is this. I have to participate with the Holy Spirit. I have to yield to Him. I have to let Him have his way. Amen. Let's worship the Lord and we're going to close tonight and we'll pick up next week. Let's give him glory. Amen.